the political side of it, and then there's the real story. There's a lot to unpack right there. It wasn't quite the interview I thought that was going to be. There's a reason for it. This will be officially my favorite podcast I've ever done. I'm fascinated that you worked at MGM. What, we, what was your time at MGM Studios? So I worked under Mark Burnett and Roma Downey, uh, head of Faith and Family content. Yeah, I'm a big fan of, of Kokorian, who had bought and sold, I believe, MGM Studios three times okay. before it ended in the hands of Amazon, right? Okay. So uh, the reason, okay, I'm t- reason I'm touching on that is because you've been uh, in, 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 in Faith and Family content for them, and you've been in media... I'm just curious about your comments on where media is right now. It's kind of, to me, it seems chaotic that so many people are cutting cords and there's so many different landscapes now with Netflix really changing the model. I'm mm-hmm. curious about your thoughts on the, the state of media and studios right now. I think there's a bit of an identity crisis, not, not in a negative way, but a positive way where we're, there's a desperation welling up within Hollywood to get back to the roots of creativity um, when for so long it's been largely led by the revenue streams and new revenue models that have, have had to happen out of forced protocols um, because the, the financial finance models have changed so vastly. So I think there, there's a real resurgence back to the, the origins of creativity and a real um, drive towards community-driven projects, which is why The Chosen has done so well. And Hollywood has taken immense notice of that. And I think that's where Hollywood will go. It will go towards not just creating you know, refined, wonderful creative content that, that can bring in the bottom line, but that it will really help bring together communities around content that that community is passionate about. And so I think Hollywood's really trying to learn that. What does that mean to create community in a place that has only purely been here for, for entertainment and revenue at the end of the day? So the, the New York Times said you guys pulled off a crowdfunding miracle. I'm kind of curious if you could talk to us about the crowdfunding effort and how it about the Chos- the chosen came about. I mean, we could go into Michigan and your background, going to Africa, all that's great. But I think the huge accomplishment here is that you did something in crowdfunding that I haven't seen before. So I'd love to hear about how, like, if you could take us from the beginning to now as to how that worked for you. Yes. Yeah, so at the time, we were the loudest crowdfunded project of all time. And so the first season was completely crowdfunded by, by about 19, 19- thousand just everyday average citizen everyday joe um, were our were our original founding members um crowdfunding members and then from there after season one everything it was done through a pay it forward model in conjunction with our distribution partner at the time angel studios and in this season during the filming of season four we transitioned to a donation model so it's completely fan sourced still, fan funded. Uh, It's no longer crowdfunded. That was only the first season, those 19,000 original investors. And then from that point on, it's been pay it forward donation model ever since. And how did you crowdfund it? Did they own part of the film or was it just more like they got a t-shirt? Uh, no, they, they got a lot of uh, great perks, like come visit on set, et cetera, et cetera, name in the credits. But no, they're, they're literal, um, have actual points in the brand. Oh, so they were able to put money in like a true crowdfund and then have a, a cut of the film Cor- uh, or the show? Yes. I mean, yes. And the, yes, the, the Chosen itself as an IP. Yes, that is correct. For season one only. Oh, oh for season one. Mm-hmm, correct. Season one. From, from that point on, it was considered profit only until we moved to a donation model. But you, now it's tax write-off for the donations. Yeah, but since you guys got picked up by CW, I presume it's a lot easier to fund it now, or no? No, so CW is just, um, a, just, just um, they're one of our licensees, so they don't own us. Uh, we've given our, uh, we've brought on Lionsgate as our global distrib- distribution partner, um, and CW is just one of the licensees, just like Netflix, just like Amazon Prime, just like Peacock. But CW just happens to be the first broadcasting network to have picked up The Chosen. Wow. But no one owns The Chosen. Is it's it sad. still owned by the original crowdfunders, or is it owned like, is it, a, is it an independent sort of nonprofit? It, it, it's vast. There are a number of key partners that, that own The Chosen and, and, some, and the, our Come and See Foundation partners as well. So it, it's across the board spread out amongst the number, and then a chunk of it are the 19,000 investors. And how and much? You have to talk to our head of finance to, to get the clear facts on that. And how much did you raise initially when you guys when they went out to crowdfunding? What, what, what site was it on? 
to, uh, I couldn't, uh, it was through Angel Studios, which was VidAngel at the time, um, and uh, ten, uh, roughly 10 million. Wow. They weren't, they weren't the one that was in the, they were, were they in a, I can't remember if VidAngels was in a lawsuit or not. Yes, they were. Were they in that? Uh, with that Disney. Was, it was, a, it was like a Supreme Court challenge or something, right? Yeah, they had, they had a huge smash up with Disney. Um, I, I don't know the inner workings enough to speak to it. No, but yeah. I saw that crowdfunding thing. That was a big deal. They crowdfunded the legal on that. And I actually followed a lot okay. what they were doing. And I was pretty impressed with the ability because they were uh, very faith-based, right? So they, they really yes. aggressively went after the faith-based community to crowdfund the lawsuit. And it sounds like yes. to crowdfund this too. Okay, yes. So uh, we weren't part of, of any of their um, journey with, with the Disney lawsuit, et cetera. But yes, they were a very instrumental in the pay it forward model and, and getting the chosen off the ground. And are they still, is VidAngel still around? Are they still in the ongoing concern? Um, I believe VidAngel is still around, but they've, they've, I don't know the right language, but they've transitioned into Angel Studios and they've done projects such as Sound of Freedom, et cetera. Um, they are no longer our distribution partners. They were our uh, global distributors for um, quite a few years, but they are no longer. So how did you get involved in The Chosen? I'm curious because I've, I've seen a little bit of it. Obviously, I love, um, I love so, I mean, I love the story, right? So it's not, it's not hard to not like it unless you're just not human. Uh, so I'm curious as to how you got involved. So I was at the time working at MGM, so under Mark Burnett Romadowney um, as the head of faith and family content. And a, the pilot episode for The Chosen uh, called The Shepherd. If you haven't seen that, because it's not part of the series itself, it's, it's fantastic. It's something very magical about it. And actually what we're releasing in theaters soon will be a woven together story of The Shepherd and the Messengers, so never seen before. So we're really excited about that. But The Shepherd came across my desk, Todd, and in this industry, we'll watch something for five seconds and we'll know what we have. And so I took notice that I was still watching it 20 seconds in, five minutes in. I was tearing up 10 minutes in. I end up watching the entire thing. And I'm properly crying by the end of it, Todd. And I remember immediately emailing Mark and Roma. And I said, you have to acquire this. This will take over the world. I just knew it. It was like I was let in on a little secret. So Mark and Roma, to their credit, immediately tried to acquire it. Um, but unfortunately, they, they weren't able to acquire it. They, uh, Dallas was already in relationship with Angel Studios at the time. And so, but I sat there and I was like, I miss, we missed a white whale. Like, this is going to take over the entire landscape. I just knew it was going to change the world. So I was very, very disappointed we missed it. I just knew we missed it. And then skip ahead a few years later, and I had just had my third baby. And my husband, who is a, a snob, especially when it comes to Christian content, he said, um, or, or faith forward content, I should say as well. And he said, you have to watch this. So I started watching it. I was like, who puts a TV show on an app? Um, I'm a two, get two and a half episodes in and I realize it dawns on me, this is the same. And it is becoming a global phenomenon. It's on its way. So very long story short, I ended up working for The Chosen. They, they made a space for me as a producer at the time. And now I'm vice president of original content. And I haven't looked back since. So you left the MGM and went there. Yes, yes, yes. Wow. And, and you only work for The Chosen? I only work for The Chosen. It's wow. a, a, a full-time gig. And wow. we, um, we have high aspirations, Todd, let me tell you. What are the aspirations? I can't tell you yet, but uh, we'll have to have a secondary conversation. We've got a lot of really fun things in the works. Well, I mean, you're going to have to tell us how you got started and decided to, I love the entrepreneurship. I love the yes. r risk on attitude. It's something we sell here in the sense that uh, are you willing to take a gamble? Are you sort of, you know, are you willing to stay your own course? Are you willing to do things that are a little bit outside the box? I would say that you leaving MGM is probably pretty outside of it, but maybe you could give oh. us a, a little background to how you got there and made that decision to leave the MGM. Yes. Where'd you start out? Uh, so I was a high school teacher. I was a high school teacher who had just an epiphany moment. Um, I myself am a Christian, so I had a, just a really powerful just revelation of soul, if you want to call it, where I just knew without a shadow of a doubt that the four walls of my classroom were too small. And I needed to, to I, I ended up moving to Africa. And let me just, Todd, I only ever wanted to be a teacher my whole life. Mm. It was the best job on the planet. And to this day, there's no other job like it. Um, so it was beyond odd that I wanted out of the classroom like it was not normal and so I gave I just gave up everything um, my family didn't understand it 
Um, very few people in my life understood it, but they, they, they said, but yet we get it. You need to do it. So I picked up everything, picked up my life, um, packed my whole life into two bags and moved to Mozambique, Africa, which if you know anything about Mozambique, it's ripe with civil war. It's uh, one of the poorest countries in the world, um, horrific circumstances, unimaginable violence at times. Um, and the, 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 the organization I was working for, IRIS, they were the only NGO, governmental or non-governmental organization that had not pulled out of Mozambique because of how, of the circumstances being so severe. So I moved there thinking I'm here for the rest of my life. Like, I'm just going to be in the dirt. I'm going to be taking care of orphans. We're going to be doing, you know, uh, social justice and, 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 and care. And, and then it wasn't before long that I just, another just surreal moment happened on, on, my, on my journey, not only as, a, as like a professional, but as a journey in my faith walk where I just knew I have to, have to go to Hollywood. And I didn't know what that meant, Todd. I just knew, okay, an actor? Like that's all I knew about Hollywood. I'm not trained. My colleagues like helped start the internet. My colleagues went to Harvard. They're trained. They're savants in the industry. I literally am a high school teacher who just said yes and risked it all and find myself now, you know, collaboratively helming the biggest TV show in the world. And it started in the dirt of Mozambique, Africa. I was just recently in Africa. What did you think of Mozambique? Oh, I love Mozambique. It's stunning. The people are, you want to know about joy. You want to learn joy from people that have nothing and experience trauma that we can't even fathom, but yet share liberally and smile all the time. It was, um, an extraordinary time. Which part of Africa did you go to? I went to Kenya and Tanzania. I have to admit, I was okay. there for a safari, so not quite the same experience you may have experienced yourself. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't stunning, get, I, I don't imagine. think it was amazing, and uh, the people are amazing. And I, 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 I don't think we we in America have no idea if you have not. It's just not possible to describe it. It's weird to it be isn't. weird to be in a place where I was. Uh, I was out, you know, right outside my front door. Or back door was, you know, elephants and uh, zebras and hippos and and. It's the stars at night. It's it, it, that's the, at that's night. a whole different conversation. I I yes. I was yes. at, I was at the rim of a crater at night with a view, uh, and it's not possible to explain. There's no lighting. Uh, in the Serengeti, so you see the full uh, breadth yes. of the Milky Way, and uh, yes. it's like it's like something you've never seen before. But um, the image that comes to my mind when you talk about violence in Mozambique and all the things that African and ha happen in African torn countries, um, and I look at you and think, okay, well, a pretty blonde woman flew off to Africa, uh, Maybe a little risk there? You think maybe just a tad bit, or did you not think <laughs> just that? Just a tad. Just a tad. My parents were panicking. Um, yeah, I mean, it was real. I was. Um, I had very long blonde hair at the time, and um, I had to just cover my hair all the time um, just to, to blend it a little bit. I'm very fair-skinned. Um, not that I ever feared for, for that dynamic, but, I mean, yeah, you you would be stopped by men on the side of the road with machetes. And it was just a common occurrence of just a completely different lifestyle. Yeah, I don't think um, that they're very uh, knowledgeable of of blonde women there. I, I just, it's like, I'm trying to like choose my oh, yeah. words with you, but no, like, yeah. that's not a no. place that, that you would go to. I, I know that I have friends in the Middle East and they're blonde and they're like, you, they, they, you're like an alien there when you're a blonde yes. woman, right? So. Yes, you're, yeah, but um. But the welcome I received, uh, just immediately, it, you just have to be savvy, you have to be smart, and you have to just be willing, like, you know the risk you signed up for, and your hope is that you can make some type of impact. But that's the naivety, I think, in the West, we'll, we'll go, we go thinking we're going to make some type of impact, and we're the ones that come back completely changed. Uh, I, I've spent uh, uh, a lot of time in Israel, I own a business there, and I'm curious, have you spent any time in Israel yourself? Yes, I've been several times. We were actually meant to be in Israel with uh, members of the cast at the end of October. Um, and we obviously had to push back. Um, you have, you have our, one of our lead actors, Simon, who plays Simon Peter. He's Israeli, so he's in Israel right now. So, yeah, um, 
I, I have um, immense love for the Israeli people, for Israel. It's uh, heartbreaking what's happening. You mentioned that you had this experience where you were told to go to Mozambique or you, mm -hmm. you felt like you needed to do this. Whatever your journey was, that's what you needed to do. And you got there and then you decided you needed to go to Hollywood. I wondered for those people who have not been to Israel, what, when you first got to Israel and you, and you, did you go to Jerusalem? Did you go to any parts? Did you go to the market in Jerusalem? Where did you go in Jerusalem? Because I want I to tell you my experience, but I don't want to pollute it with, with your experience. Yeah, the first time I went, I was we're at MGM, and they wanted, it was about, gosh, about six years ago, and they wanted um, some millennials to come. And so uh, a colleague and I who were millennials came, and we did a whole series while they're invited by, um, by the government and, and media, various media outlets within Israel. And so we stayed right outside of Jerusalem, but we went everywhere. We went everywhere. We went to the West Bank, we went to uh, Bethlehem, we went to the Dead Sea, we went everywhere. And um, Israel gets in your bones. There's no other place on the planet. I'm very well traveled as I'm sure you are. It was the only place that you miss the moment you leave. Mm. Yeah, I was uh, dumbfounded by how, I don't know how to explain it. It's a weird, first of all, I, I go to Tel Aviv. It's beautiful there. I'm on the water coast. That's kind of hard to understand because when you, you as an American, you think of Israel, you think of like drama and Scud missiles and Iraq and all that stuff. And all the people, first of all, uh, and I apologize because I, I, uh, I, my, my, sometimes my mouth gets ahead of me a little bit, but every woman there is beautiful. All right. The whole country's pretty. Everyone there is pretty. The food's amazing. You're on the Mediterranean coast. And then you head over on into Jerusalem, you go over the Temple Mount. It's, it's the most spiritual place I've ever been part of. I don't know how to explain the feeling of how old everything is. And, and um, it's just remarkable. Like, I just think if it just, I don't even know how to explain the interaction with the people there. And um, I, I was raised Greek Orthodox, so their Greek Orthodox have like a pretty dominant area there in the Temple Mount, but I was just, I was just stunned by um, uh, all the barrel ahead of the Temple Mount, all around it, uh, the valleys, the different uh, places. I went to the Sea of Galilee. I went to the Golan Heights. Um, it just doesn't seem, it seems just incredible. I wonder if you could talk to the audience about how amazing it is. Yeah, I mean, what was... I think what struck me the most was how um, here you have this land where, you know, in, in, in the Torah or in the Bible of the Old Testament, you have man that was made out of dust, right? This very land was literally what breathed human, God breathed into it, created humans. Obviously Eve from, from, from the rib of right. Adam. But my, my point being, I remember that is what struck me the most is just this, this, this land I'm walking on, this dirt, um, throughout time, throughout, you know, this book I love so much, throughout, it just, it embodies life. Um, talk about, you know, your, your, so much of your life is spent on just talking about risk, Todd, and you're just like, here is this land that generations have risked immensely for the beauty of this land and, and, and just how alive this land is. And there's nothing, I don't care, cause I'm like, my mom went no faith at all when she went to Israel for the first time and she came back with an immense faith. Mm. It activated something in her. It was like touching that lineage, that legacy, that generational reality that I've only ever experienced in Israel. And like my hometown is London and talk about history, rich history. And, sure. and even, even London can't touch on Israel. Um, even Africa and its rich history couldn't touch on what Israel. There's something where I just tell everyone, I said, I don't care what faith you are. You have to go there one day. And you will see faiths coexisting like I've never seen before. That's well it's stunning. It's well said, because I couldn't have said it better. You said it well, which is that it will ignite faith with you. You can't kind of deny that it exists mm -hmm. there. You can't deny uh, what's happening, whether it's Holy Spirit or whatever you think it is. Yes. Uh, it's something to everybody. I've never taken anyone there that didn't have some of it, have some effect on on them. Um, I kind of detected that you had a little bit of an accent, by the way. So I wasn't going to go there because it says Michigan and California. Yes. Okay, so all right, I wasn't hallucinating here. 
No, you're, um, you're not. You're, the, it confuses everybody. I call myself a bit of a mutt. Yeah. There you go. I'm, I'm curious about artistic license. You know, one of the things that, uh, well, I, I won't comment on the exact remnants of the Bible and how it was written. It's just so complicated to most people. But you do have to take some artistic license when you make the chosen, right? I mean, you can't, it, it seems like it's impossible to know what we, I mean, I guess we read stories that are told to us in the Bible. We try to interpret them this way. But I wonder if you could talk about sort of the blank spaces you had to go into with the chosen, how you decide how to have that artistic license. Yeah, and that's where Dallas Jenkins, who's the creator of The Chosen, is so, it's one of the areas of his genius to where he he understands that, okay, we have these hard black and white lines of scripture, they, but they were whole lives lived within the lines of, the, of, of those black and white lines of scripture. And so he's, so he's going with, with, with our, our various team members and co-writers, and he's going, okay, how do we dive into the historical accuracy of what, what life was like? And also just the, the, the realities of human nature, like women miscarried back then, just like they do today. Why, could, why can't we have one of our characters mis miscarry to where it's just relatable? Like, thing, like the hardships of life haven't changed throughout millennia. And so talk about risk, Todd. Like what is so amazing? Because I've worked in the, in, in the kind of the bridge or the cross section between mainstream media and faith media for close to 20 years. And what Dallas is the first person I have met that is willing to disrupt the church a little bit in the effort of pushing through toward humanity and authenticity. And that is what the chosen does so well. And so because of his willingness to kind of ruffle some feathers on, you know, he's not after pissing people off, but he is after authenticity and the, hum the human side of what is in between the lines of scripture. And so that's what we see come alive in The Chosen. And because of it, you have faiths from across the world coming together under the banner that is the show. You have Hindus, Buddhists, you have Christians, agnostics, atheists across the board loving the show for that exact reason. I was just recently with Matt, uh, the CEO of TBN, and Tom in, in Dallas, and uh, they got... Um, you know, one of my favorite pastors around by far the last 20 plus years is Joel Olstein. Uh, I'm a huge fan. And they got him on the phone with me and I was talking to him. It was really one of the greatest things. It was so, so much fun. But I was curious as if, if TBN has played The Chosen or how, how you guys distribute it. Do they get to play it? How do other Christian networks play it? Are they allowed to rebroadcast re it? What's happening with someone like TBN, which has a global presence in so many countries? Yeah, so I know they, last I was involved with the distribution perspective, uh, they definitely had season one, I believe season two. I'm not sure where they're at with season three, but TBN um, are, are dear friends of ours and, and close friends of ours. And, and Tom himself helped to um, helped for us to go film in Tuscany with Andrea Bocelli for our Christmas special. So we couldn't have done it without, without TBN. What did you think? I, I heard that they put water down. So when he played on the piano on that rock, it kind of looked like icy or something. Yes. I saw some pictures was, of that. Yes, it were, was stunning. And it was so dusty that we also had to water it down. Were you, right, were you right there when that was happening? Yeah, I was right there being such a little groupie in the corner, being like, that's Andrea Bocelli. Yeah. What a legend. Yeah, for sure. I've actually, uh, I've actually spent a little time with Matt and Tom. And actually, Tom's helping us with a project right now. We, we like him a lot. I, I, the, the, Andrea Bocelli's not really my target market. I really wanted to be a sponsor, but it was really hard for me to explain to my board how that would make any sense in the metaverse, which is what we, we have a metaverse product. We're trying to figure out how to, how to do it. Just we couldn't come together with what the project would look like. But yes. this is for his 30th anniversary next year, right? Yes, I heard about that. What he filmed for us for was our, our theatrical release. Um, but Tom did tell me about the 30, the 30 year yeah. celebration, which I know, is amazing. I, I, know, I know they're pretty excited about it. I think they're gonna do it yes. sort of at his home or in his hometown. There's going to be an exclusive number of people there, maybe two days or something like that. That's amazing. Yeah, that is amazing. So I was, I was going back to the artistic, we, got, we took a right turn, but, uh, so they have shown this on the T, on TBN. That would make sense to me. Yes. Uh, okay, got yes. it, yes. got it, got it, got it. I, I, I look forward to telling Tom that I met you because uh, uh, he's a super nice guy. I spent some time with him oh. down in there. Have they told you about their new studios and their TV show and 
with yes. Huckabee and all that stuff that's going on. Yes, he yeah. told me about that and his even his recent excursions, uh, filming in Israel. They've got some amazing stuff. Have you ever seen Tom in action producing? I haven't. No. Oh my goodness, he is a marvel. He, you can tell. Okay, you're like Tom. You're the real deal. He's. Very rarely do you come across a producer of that caliber. It was a real honor working wow, with him. Wow, wow, wow. I'm, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm sure he'll love to hear how. That's a, that's a big endorsement for Tom. So w what's next for you guys? I mean, you can't really tell us a lot about what's next, but how long will The Chosen go on? I mean, it's not like the story of the Jesus doesn't really have an ending, but there is a little bit of some things that happen along the way. When, where are you and how long will the show go on for? Yeah, so we're releasing theatrically season four on February 2nd. And then from there, we will start filming in April, season five. And we have a total of seven seasons set for The Chosen. And then um, from there, we're really exploring, okay, what does it, we have a lot of people begging us to do the Book of Acts or various other Bibles in, in, in the, very other books in the Bible, I should say, excuse me. So we're we're exploring what you know what is it that we're meant to be doing next. Um, we have three more years of the chosen. Wow! And you you expect to be there all three years yourself? I do. Yes, I do. Well, I I, I got to tell you, I'm really fascinated by the number of of people that have supported what you've done and how you guys crowdfunded. It's really amazing. Is it still the big crowd biggest crowdfunding to date in terms of film theatrical release? I think we've been dethroned for that title, uh, maybe for a future film, don't quote me, but I do remember being dethroned, um, which is wonderful. There, there's more than enough to go around. Um, but I think we are, de like our, our metrics are just through the roof, Todd. It's, it's, it's it, just wild. Is it true you it's got wild. 510 million views? Is that total or for a certain oh, period we, of time? Yeah, we have more than that at the moment. Um, we're, we're, we're diving into the metrics and getting them authenticated now. But if they stand, um, it, it, uh, we've never seen this level of growth before. And the, going back to the community aspect, that's, that's what the driver is. And I think that is the great change that will come to Hollywood. So as I get older, I, I, I think about the quality of the product produced. You know, I, I don't know if you saw this weekend, but one of the Marvel films like did 47 million, not very well for Disney. Um, and I try to not really be political here, but like, I can't help but see this whole where we made Snow White into a different Snow White. Uh, mm -hmm. Are you familiar with this? Uh, yep. Snow White isn't Snow White and she's not allowed to be with the prince and Mm -hmm. I, I don't know, what, and, I, and it was a stalker story, which makes no sense to me because he was in it for five oh. minutes. So I'm curious about um, you being a person of faith, how you watch what Hollywood is producing and not think to yourself that it's just, uh, I know that sort of every generation probably complains about this problem, right? I mean, there was probably a point in time where it said, if you remember in Far and Away, Tom uh, Cruise says to, Whatever, whatever, who was this, what, Nicole Kidman, hey, cover your ankles, right? Well, that was probably outrageous back then. And then eventually it was like, you know, cover your knees. Now it's, uh, I, I don't know, terrible songs you can hear that are just like the most disgusting things ever. Uh, but yet they're popular. I'm not saying that you can't enjoy something that's popular. But this, uh, I, I thought the Wall Street Journal said that this is actually brings, sort of brings attention to, to to Hollywood that faith-based programming is still there, but I'm curious mm -hmm. as to whether, do you really think it's still there or do you think it's too far gone and that's just really a niche at this point? Or do you think people are thirsty for stuff that's more a little less killing? Even when I watch uh, Yellowstone, everyone's getting murdered. <laughs> it's like, it's, it, I, I watch uh, a lot of these films like, um, what's the one with uh, Ozarks? I, I, there wasn't a happy scene in the whole thing. Like, there wasn't one happy scene. It was from one death or murder to another. And I'm curious about where you think faith-based media is going. Is Does it exist anymore? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's only room for it to grow. Um, my, my, my hope is that it would be kept uh, pure, if you will, unadulterated. Um, I think if, if we are to learn anything from this last season of filmmaking, content creation, it's Top Gun Maverick. 
And that was such a restoration of the old Hollywood model of pure escapism. We're going to give you a good ending. We're going to give you the trials and the hardship and having to walk through trauma. Yes, but we're going to make it about the unified goal of the human, the human condition and the ability to rise above. That's what people need to be reminded of. This generation is so hopeless and we need content more than ever, whether it's faith-based or Top Gun Maverick, to help reignite the human will to thrive and be victorious and overcome. And that's where I think content's failing people right now. Well, I think that's a good ending. I appreciate you being here. I, I, I do get that. Thank you for saying that. I do get that Top Gun Maverick thing. I kind of lo- I want. I saw the original, and I, you know, I was really big into. Pl- I was really big into. I loved it at the time. It was really, it was really a leap forward, and it was kind of yes. remade if you look at it right. But it, you felt good watching it. It was a, it was a good feeling. Um, Hopefully there's more people like you that are going to produce that kind of content. So uh, we appreciate your time. Where can people see it right now? What's, when, they, when, can they, when they come out with the next season, where is the optimal point uh, place to see it, to watch it? Yeah, so we'll globally be releasing in theaters on February 2nd. That's season four, episodes one through three. And then we'll, we're going to be the first TV show ever to release the entire season in theaters before it goes to our app. But right now you can catch up seasons one through three on on platforms from Peacock to Amazon to Netflix. It's an amazing show. We hope you can join us. So you're going to release it theatrically? We can see it in theaters too? Oh, wow. And all three seasons? Uh, No, all the whole season of of season four will be released. Oh, got it. Got it. So you you, you watch the first three seasons and then go see season four in the theater. Yes. So catch up on seasons one through three and then get ready to see season four. But it's, yeah. Well, hopefully you, can, fir- hopefully you can come back right after you release it and we can yes. talk about the show again and do a follow-up. I appreciate your time. Oh, thanks I for, love that, Todd. Thanks for, the, for being candid. We look forward to seeing The Chosen. I am going to go watch all of it. Yes, please. I can't wait to hear about it. And please, please send Tom my love. Thank you so much. It was really good meeting you, Todd. Good to meet you, too. Take care. You know, I'm going to explain to you this way. Don't be rolling yet. There's a reason for it. So, so I did get that right. I did get that yeah, right. You I got it right.